evening everyone today uh, good evening to our evening session of leadership and strategy webinars of northeast ohio chapter today uh, we will hear from joe about preparing to take your bmi acb agile exam uh, our agenda today introduction quick introduction as usual presentation after the webinar presentation we have a question and answer session upcoming chapter events call for speakers uh, this is special for this webinars uh, claiming your bdus just a quick reminder we are using uh, zoom as a platform for our webinar please uh, be sure that you mute your mic and for any questions or discussion, just use the chat feature on the Zoom. A special thanks to our sp sponsors, ABEX Systems, Strategic Systems, Tech Systems. Welcome to our new members uh, for October 2020. Just keep it for a minute. And uh, congratulations to newly certified leaders in October 2020. Today, our speaker, Joe Anastasia, an IT manager at Progressive Insurance and has project management and portfolio management experience within the EPMO organization. Joe also teaches project management courses at Cleveland State University and Tri-C. Joe has been an active volunteer with the local chapter since 1998 and has held many roles within the chapter. He's currently the operations board member leading the member service function of the chapter. Um, I'll turn it, not taking too much time, I'll turn it to Joe. Joe. Great. Thank you, Amir. I appreciate it. Good, night. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, attending the session tonight. I'm happy to present uh, uh, the PMI ACP exam and how you can best prepare for it. I, I thought I would share this um, slide. This is pretty recent information. PMI has kind of solidified their roadmap for Agile certifications. Uh, and this information is available on the website at the URL at the bottom. And we will be providing this slide deck and a recording of the presentation um, soon to anybody that participated today. Uh, the, <clears throat> as far as our journey to business agility, they have uh, five different paths, depending on the type of individual you are and the kind of certification you're looking for. Um, if we are going to cover the PMI ACP, which is featured on the left hand side, um, that is for the agile certified practitioner. So not necessarily the leader of the team, but it could be, um, it could be just a team member, the development team, uh, product owner, depending on the role or, or the leader, uh, scrum master, iteration manager. So that ACP exam is pretty broad in its reach. We're gonna talk about that as we go through the slides tonight. Uh, there is, and I'm going counterclockwise. So bottom left, Discipline Agile Value Stream Consultant. Uh, there's a big, obviously um, Agile is a subset of Lean, Value Stream Mapping, Value Stream, um, looking at processes and optimizing processes. There is an Agile uh, certification uh, focused on that. Uh, bottom right, Discipline Agile Coach, coaching teams to effectively apply Discipline Agile. Uh, this is very more of a general purpose coach role uh, to help your, once you get certified, to be able to coach your team members into applying Agile Discipline. Upper right, uh, the Agile Senior Scrum Master. In the top, uh, Discipline Agile Scrum Master. 
So the uh, those two, in a way, addresses the demand out there for Scrum Masters. Scrum is the number one um, agile approach that's available out there. Um, there's a high demand for Scrum Masters. So they have a level one and level two, essentially, um, Scrum Master certification. Um, I essentially uh, competing with the certified scrum master, the professional scrum master, uh, and other uh, scrum master certifications on the market today. So I encourage you to take advantage of um, what PMI has to offer. They do have a variety of certifications. Our focus tonight is on the PMI ACP. And uh, I think we can move on to the next slide. Um, if you have any questions, as Amir said, just drop them in the chat and uh, we'll be looking for those. All right, so the ACP exam, um, it's the credential for Agile Certified Practitioners. So unlike the PMP, where the PMP is focused on the project manager, the leader, uh, the ACP exam is focused on the practitioner. The practitioner could be a team member, product owner, business analyst, um, the leader of the team. It's What it does is it helps you prove that you have a broad base of agile um, knowledge that you could apply to whatever approach your organization chooses. Not every company will pick Scrum. Not every company will pick XP, extreme programming. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Uh, they may do their own blended agile approach for projects. So this ACP exam really covers that for anybody that um, wants a broad knowledge of agile principles and practices and be able to apply those on the job. Good news is, and you know, because of COVID it's been exacerbated, but the, and the, the demand has been higher. But today the ACP exam, the CAPM, the Certified Associate Project Management exam and the PFP exam are available for you to take at home or at the office. Um, or you may go into a Pearson View testing center. Um, I put in parentheses eventually, I'm not sure if the Pearson View centers are open or if they're open with limited capacity. But uh, what's great about these three exams is you could take them at home or at the office in uh, privacy. Uh, you will need to uh, be able to prove that you don't have any papers or cheat sheets on the desk, uh, that you're alone quiet, there's a proctor that kind of monitors you're taking the exam. Uh, PMI has switched from having both Prometric and Pearson View offer testing. They've now gone sole source to just Pearson View who can administer tests throughout the world, whether proctored online, proctored in a, in a testing center building, uh, or even in a pop-up. Um, They'll do pop-up testing if you have enough people. On the exam, there's gonna be 120 questions. 100 of them will be scored, 20 of them are not scored. The, basically what they do is they test, test questions on people. So 20 of those questions, you won't know whether it's a test, test question or unscored question, or I'll call it a real question. You're just taking the exam. And your goal is to get as many right as possible, right? Because your your goal is to pass. And I would not worry about whether it's a, a good, um, a scorable question or a non-scored question. But just, just know that out of the 120, 100 of them count. And you won't know which 100. Uh, you'll have three hours in duration with no breaks. Uh, at least that's as of today. Who knows? They may change uh, that in the future. I believe the PMP exam starting in January, there's going to be a forced break, uh, about a third or almost 40% into the exam. Uh, but we're not here to talk about that tonight. But uh, I think they are looking at, especially in the test at home um, environments, to have a scheduled break. But as of today, the ACP is three hours straight, no breaks. Um, it's available in five languages, English, Arabic, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, and Spanish. Next slide. 
All right, so who should apply? This is you know lifted directly from the PMI website, the links down below. Uh, any who should apply? Any if you work on agile teams or if your organization is adopting agile practices, the ACP is a good choice for you. It is not um, method specific; um, it's broad, and it basically gives uh, anybody looking at you um, and your credential. Uh, that you have the knowledge about um, the essence of all the different Agile practices out there. Uh, there's member and non-member pricing. Obviously, there's always a deal if you're a member of PMI Global and the prereqs are there. Secondary degree, 21 hours of Agile training, uh, 12 months of Agile project experience, not leading. It could be just doing. Um, if you're a PMP or PGMP, they'll waive that project experience thing for you. Um, and you'll need um, eight months of agile project experience within the last three years. And when you fill out the application, you just need to be able, when you do fill out the app, make sure that you have witnesses or references for everything that you claim in case you do get audited. Um, the certification bottom left has 120 questions as we discussed, 100 count, 20 don't, you got three hours to take it. Once you get your ACP, you'll know right away, right after you take the test, they'll tell you you passed or failed. Um, if you pass, uh, you are automatically an ACP. You will earn, need to earn 30 professional development units in agile topics every three years. So, um, which is not, um, uh, terribly hard to do. And there is some, I'm going to use my words, not theirs, buy one, get one free. So if you have multiple certifications, there are times where something could apply to your ACP and your PMP if you have both. Um, and in some cases, if you even have to cap them, there may be some opportunity for overlap. Um, but we won't get into specifics here. Uh, but it's a great way to maintain your ACP. You worked hard to test and you want to keep it. Next slide. Um, we're not going to go into the handbook uh, specifically, but if you go to that ACP page on the PMI site, there's a handbook. Definitely go look through the entire handbook. It tells you how to apply the timeline, you know, from the um, starting the application process, submitting your application, uh, determining whether or not you're going to get audited, responding to a potential audit all those things, uh, payment, and then you'll have, um, I believe a year from the approval, they'll give you an ID. You'll have a year from that approval date to actually go take your exam. Um, I would highly recommend not waiting a year. Um, uh, once you've got the training and you're ready to go and the stuff's in your head, take the exam when you're ready, don't wait. Um, eligibility is listed in there and talks about renewal. Uh, the content outline is also available there. I'm going to highlight it in the other slides on, in this presentation, but that uh, outline will be available there, and it'll tell you exactly what kind of questions or what kind of topics are covered on the exam. Next slide. Oh. The um, study materials. So. There is a list of books that PMI recommends. At the beginning of the process, uh, when they first announced the exam, there were like 12 or 14 books that they recommend that you read in order to best prepare for the exam. Now, there are some um, consolidated uh, exam prep books that I'm gonna recommend here. These are personal recommendations, not chapter recommendations. Uh, but they're books that you can consider to kind of maybe uh, consolidate some of their writing. However, the books they do recommend are very good books. There's a book on Agile retrospectives. Um, uh, there's other really good books in that list. The um, Agile Practice Guide by PMI. It's a new offering with the sixth edition PMBOK. If you get the bundle, there's the PMBOK, the Project Management Body of Knowledge, and then there's also the Agile Practice Guide. I feel like that Agile Practice Guide is a good um, study materials for the exam. They may not say so themselves, but as I read that doc, uh, that 
uh, agile practice guide a few times. They're like, boy, there's a lot of really good information in here. And that would help somebody take the exam and definitely help somebody that's pursuing agile in their organization. Uh, you definitely want to be comfortable with the agile manifesto. You want to be comfortable with the agile principles. There's going to be questions on the exam on uh, both of those things and um, any other books that are out there. Again, whenever you apply for certifications, they don't say just study one book. They're looking for general knowledge, not, hey, just study this one book and take the exam. Although there are some good study materials out there that consolidates things. But there's good books out there about Kanban, Scrum, Agile, Extreme Programming, Lean, Retrospectives. All of those would help you with your studies. Okay, next slide. All right, so again, this is Joe, my personal recommendation as far as books, not the chapters. Uh, this is the first one. This is a book by uh, Mike Griffiths. Uh, he is a certified scrum master and an ACP. He authored this book a few years ago, looks like about two, three years ago. And uh, yeah, I've used it to study. I actually use it you know, also as a reference. Um, it's an exam prep guide. It has uh, sample questions. It has an overview of the topics covered on the exam. It's pretty comprehensive. I've known uh, peers of mine that have used this as their primary source to study, although they have read other books and they've done really well on the exam and passed. Uh, next slide. Uh, another book, uh, this is by uh, Andy Crow. Uh, he's an Agile certified practitioner. Uh, Andy Crow works for a company called Velociteach. Velociteach is a chapter partner uh, on our chapter website. If you go up, and I don't have the website memorized, but there is a section where you can get uh, a discount on training through Velocity Teach, both self-study and um, in person or online, if you will, proctored, I would say. Um, so they're a very good um, partner of ours. And uh, this particular book by Andy Crow uh, is also an excellent guide for helping you study for the exam. Uh, the prior book that was on the prior page, it's about an inch thick. This book is about half inch thick. So, um, but you know, size doesn't matter, content does. So, you know, if you can afford to buy both books, get both books. And that's my recommendation, not the chapters. Next slide. Third, third, art, um, third um, artifact here that I really like is this uh, PMI ACP exam prep. Now this book is strictly test questions. They're, they're sample questions. There's no real kind of educational content in here. It's just question, question, question with answers. So it'll help you study. Um, even though these books that I'm sharing with you are a few years old, they have not changed the ACP exam in the last four years. So you should be good. Um, get the latest editions of any of these books if you're interested, of course. Uh, they are, um, it's a very good book by Christopher Scordo, a thousand practice questions. I mean, to really get good at any of these certifications, you have to study, you have to read, but you have to take practice exams over and over and over again until you're solidly into passing, like real good passing, like 80, 90 percent tile A or B if you're used to grades, uh, grades in school. You want to get A's and B's on these uh, practice exams uh, consistently uh, before going and signing up and taking the real one. Um, typically, the practice questions out there are a little bit harder than the real ones on the real exam. But I always say, go in over prepared, knock it out of the park, get your certification, and then, you know, the stress is gone. It's better to be over prepared and ready and pass with flying colors uh, than the being under prepared or um, worrying about whether or not you have have the uh, the knowledge to pass. So those are three good books that you I would recommend you look at. You can also look at those 12 books that PMI recommends as well. Next slide. Um, 
There's also a website called quizlet.com. Now this is, um, I know there's people out there that like there's quizlet.com and there's like Wikipedia, not that Wikipedia is a study uh, site for studying, but there's, um, you know, you have people that like are a little critical of sites like these because it's user generated content. It's not professional, in this case, quiz writers or flashcard writers. There are people like you and me creating flashcards. Um, but some of them are really good. So I, all I would say is there's a lot of good sample flashcards out there, matching games. Um, the content is free, but not necessarily 100% accurate. So buyer beware. Um, I find a lot of stuff out there that is pretty good. If there's something down there that contradicts something I read in the textbook, I go to the, I go with what the textbook says. But um, when you're in doubt, like if Quizlet says apple and your book says banana, you go with banana. <laughs> um, but the uh, Quizlet.com I find is a good education resource, even beyond the ACP, the PMP, the CAPM. Uh, they've got NCLEX for nursing. They got a whole bunch of stuff out there. So it's really good, in my opinion, just buyer beware. Next slide. Um, I already said this, I'll probably continue to say this. Practice, practice, practice. Take practice and mock exams multiple times. Now, one thing I'll tell you, don't necessarily take the same exact questions multiple times and go, oh, I'm ready, because all you're doing is then memorizing answers, not building the skill set needed to navigate a question. They're going to be multiple choice, learning how to eliminate choices, right? So if you take the same 50 question practice exam, exam over and over and over until you get it perfect, that's nice, but you've learned how to memorize those answers, not how to take the exam. Uh, so you want a variety. That's why I recommended Christopher Scordo's book with a thousand questions, right? You could take them chunks at a time. Um, you want to pass with 75% correct consistently or even higher. I always recommend 80, 90%. Like you want to nail it. 30% um, of the real exam is easy. 40% are medium. 30% are difficult. Depending on who you are, you may di dispute that after you take the exam. Um, but that's the, the, um, the kind of the way they set it up. It's kind of like a normal curve there where they'll have easy questions, medium and difficult. They're going to give you those questions in random order. So they're not going to give you the easy ones first. Um, it's not one of those, uh, they call them adaptive uh, exams where they kick you out after so many questions. If you're getting them wrong, nope, you get a chance to answer all 120 questions. Uh, just know that um, the uh, they, they will mix it up. Uh, there's a question um, from Mark in the chat. Let me go pick that up. Um, do the questions tend to have a single appropriate choice or do they tend to put two answers that could both be very right? Um, anytime I would suggest anybody taking the CAPM, the PMP or the ACP, assume that you could probably eliminate two choices and then the final two could both be right. One of them may be more right or may have better wording, or may be more directive. Um, there are some cases where there's four answers and only one's really correct. Um, I, well, and there's only one correct, ultimately. Uh, but sometimes you get it down to two, and they, sound, they both sound right. Um, but uh, it's always the best answer, not the only answer, at least in the ACP today. So very good question, Mark. Good to see you. Um, you need to learn how to eliminate choices and pick the best answer from what's left. Prior to taking the real exam, practice taking the exam at home or the office. That's where you're gonna end up taking the real one anyway until um, unless you decide to go into a testing center. You assume no breaks, uh, spend as much time on the exam as possible. Now, yes, you can get up and go to the restroom. I think they allow for that. Uh, I would recommend, and this is, um, I don't want to get too too much uh, TMI here, but um, try to avoid like a heavy meal before the exam. Uh, try not to load up on a lot of beverages or, um, or uh, coffee before the exam. 
uh, you you want to kind of be as comfortable as possible. Find a place in your home where you're very comfortable. Got great lighting. Eliminate all distractions. So if you've got noise or construction or whatever that's not conducive for test taking, um, find some place somewhere where you get three hours um, of good study time. If you're going to be home or at the office, make sure your Wi-Fi is strong because um, you don't want any breaks or because what will happen, um, even if they let you re-enter the exam after uh, after uh, an outage, uh, you know, the clock's going to keep ticking. So you got three hours, period. Take advantage of this. Mark questions for review. Um, I would say you need to answer every question. Do not leave any questions unanswered. An unanswered question is wrong. A question with a guess, an intelligent guess, increases your chances. So if you're looking at a question, go, mm, I think it's A or B. I'm going to pick A, and then I'm going to mark it for review and come back and review it later. Um, if you're finding that you are marking every question for review, then you probably didn't study enough or you're just not confident. Um, you should only pick a handful of questions. To, I don't say handful. Yeah, a small set of them for review so that when you complete the exam, you can go back to the ones you marked for review, double check them. Heck, sometimes you take an exam and you've all experienced this. You take an exam and the answer to one question is like five questions later, right? So you go through it and go, oh, okay. And because you marked it for review, you can go back and go, all right, they probably meant Scrum or they probably meant XP because they have framed the question later on that helped helped you with that. Sometimes that those um, those things happen. But again, mark questions for review if you're not comfortable with the answer, but absolutely positively answer every question on the exam. If you're running out of time, go through and answer every question. Uh, one of the common things when I teach, uh, I teach uh, PMP and CAPM and ACP exam taking uh, courses and um, I did have one student that um, won't name names, but didn't pass her um, the PMP. And the reason was they ran out of time. Uh, so time management is key. You want to be able to answer a question in under a minute. Some questions you'll answer in 10 seconds. Some questions will take you two, three minutes. Um, answer every question, mark the ones you don't know, and then go back to your marked ones after you've completed all the questions to potentially change your answer or leave your answer. You'll often find that you were probably right the first time. Okay, next uh, slide, Amir. Thank you. Um, Agile is based on lean. So if, if I don't have the graphic here, so if you think of lean as like this huge umbrella and then Agile's underneath it, and from when inside of Agile, there are things like Scrum and XP and all these other uh, things, but Agile is based on lean principles. Agile is born from software development, but it's not limited to those types of projects. Agile can be applied to marketing, process development, creative works, and many other projects. Um, some people have tried to apply Agile to construction. Um, if it's an R&D effort or you're building models, maybe that works for large heavy duty construction. Um, predictive or waterfall is a better way to go. But there's you'd be surprised how many places could use Agile. They just don't know to. And uh, I'll explain a little bit more about Agile in the upcoming slides. Um, the Agile Manifesto and the Agile Principles are key background for understanding Agile. you got to have those nailed. Um, really understanding the Manifesto and then the Principles. Next slide. Uh, the Agile Manifesto, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have to come to value individuals and interactions over process and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. While there's value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. This is key. What they are not saying in the Agile Manifesto that you should not have process, you should not have tools, you should not have documentation, you shouldn't have contracts. What they're saying is in an Agile world, 
the items on the left are more important. So having that relationship with individuals, interactions, um, having working software over documentation is more important. If the software is broken, they're gonna go to the documentation. But if your software is working, they may or may not look at the documentation, of course. Um, customer collaboration and all the agile methodologies, the customer is key, the customer is there day to day, participating, especially in the scrum approach. The customer is in the room with the development team, with the scrum master. They are helping to drive requirements, prioritize work, answer questions um, real time. And uh, that relationship with the customers in a collaborative way is much better than, hey, I'll call you next week when we're done, or let's strike a contract and then I'll, I'll call you two months when we have the prototype done. Nope, the customer's in the room all times. And then being change management oriented over following a plan, this is the hardest thing for people uh, because there's a, well, it's not in the plan. In the Agile world, the plan, plan is just a guide, right? It just gives you a rough idea. Things can change every day, every two weeks, every iteration or sprint. Next slide. The Agile principles. So there's four, I've got three slides on this. So highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. If you lift the word software out of there, a valuable product, service, or result. Um, it's that satisfying the customer. If the customer is there in the room and seeing the deliverables and seeing the delivery real time, they'll be more satisfied because they're there. They're part of the build. They're part of the creation of the product, not um, waiting for it to be shipped to them. Um, you want to welcome changing requirements. This frustrates people. We're Many of us that grew up with the predictive where you lock requirements and then you start doing design, it drives us uh, crazy. Um, but I've learned that you gotta let that go in an agile world, the requirements are gonna change constantly. All, all you do is, um, if you can recall the iron triangle in the agile world, the scope may change, but the time and cost, maybe you fix those so that you have some control. Um, Delivering working software frequently. So there's always a show me every two weeks, every three weeks, every four weeks, there's something to show off, uh, review with the customer, review with stakeholders. Um, the shorter time boxes, the better. The more often you show people progress, the more confident they are in what you're doing and the more likely your product is gonna be what you want. Uh, business people and developers must work together daily. Next slide. Did I do that or is that you? Hi, Joel. Yeah, this is the oh. next slide. Yep. Yeah, I should. I probably should have marked these so they had a little different color. Um, build uh, projects around motivated people, right? Give them the environment and support and in a way get out of their way. If they have an impediment, solve it. The most efficient and effective method of conveying information is face-to-face. Um, now, in this world of virtual, it's like getting on Microsoft Teams, Zoom, or WebEx, or Google Meet, or whatever tool of choice it is, Skype, and get face-to-face -face with somebody and talk it through. Um, working software is a primary measure of progress. If you can point at it, you can say, see, it's, it's advancing, it's evolving. These were our goals for this time box, these two weeks, and look what we've done. Um, Agile processes promote sustainable development. Sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Um, ideally in the Agile world, gone are the days of the, um, you know, the seven day week, 12 hour day, pizza every night for dinner, crazy um, uh, wartime footing on, um, uh, like overworking people over time. It's like, if you can get people to work at a constant pace consistently, uh, have them develop patterns, have them realize that, you know, on Monday I do this and on Tuesday I do that, 
um, you'll get that kind of cadence and that'll be very supportive of uh, what you wanna do as far as the agile work. Next slide. And you'll retain people, you won't burn them out. Uh, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design, simplicity, maximize the work amount of work not done. That's an interesting statement, right? We're, we live in this world where we want to do more, do more, do more, do more with less, right? This kind of flips it on its back. It says, no, keep it simple. Maximize the amount of work not done. Focus on the immediate priorities, focus on the customer needs. Um, and then ultimately you'll, you'll evolve incrementally to the product that you're, or, or software that you're shooting for. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Let people organize the team, organize around the work. Um, they should estimate their own work. They should hold each other accountable when work's not getting done. That's the best. Um, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective and tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. Um, in the scrum approach, they call that reflection uh, a retrospective. A retrospective is a compound word, retro meaning behind, spective meaning look. So it's a look behind. What, what do we do? How do we behave? Do we follow process? Um, and do that on a regular basis. Some of us lead projects. We do a retrospective at the end of the project, 12 months in, but you know it's too late. Um, by the time you learn that, you may pass on some knowledge to the next project team, but you could have been changing and adopting things along the way. Doing retrospectives every two weeks is ideal. And then you, you pick off the things that are most valuable to fix and you fix them um, based on that feedback. Okay, next slide. All right, project approaches. So predictive, another name for it is waterfall. Uh, the waterfall, uh, if uh, I know many of you are familiar with Gantt charts, uh, you got the Gantt chart with those bars and the bars on a waterfall project look like a waterfall. So there's um, a bar for task A and then a bar for task B that's underneath it. So it looks like you could pour water on the top and if it slide down, down and to the right. Um, in Agile, you can be iterative and or incremental. Iterative being um, time box. So you set two week goals, four week goals, keep them short, shorter to better. And you iterate through um, consistent periods. You don't go two weeks, one iteration or one time box, and then three weeks the next time. That's that's baloney. You do it always two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, no matter what gets done. That cadence, that um, pattern setting helps the team kind of go, okay, it's Wednesday. I got to turn in my final good stuff so that because we're having a demo in the afternoon to our customer and we're doing a retrospective after the demo, right? And you get people in a pattern and um, it's easier to schedule work. It's easier to get consistency. Uh, that kind of thing. If something doesn't happen by Wednesday, it moves to the next iteration or sprint or whatever we call it. But that time boxing is good. It gets people into a pattern. Um, and you get consistency. Uh, and incremental, you build a solution over time. You start with, uh, you know, if you're building um, on a motor scooter and you start with a wheel and then you get to a skateboard and then you get a motorized skateboard and then you put pedals on it et cetera, et cetera, eventually it becomes a scooter. Um, there's another um, element to incremental build. Um, you're building in increments, you're adding every time, you're adding functionality, you're adding features. Uh, there's this other technique called vertical slicing where you look at the solution and say, okay, we're gonna take one slice. Um, where let's say you're, you're building a competitive website to Amazon. Your first thing you're gonna work on is the login screen. And the second thing you're gonna work on is um, the storefront. And then the third thing you're gonna work on is the payment system or whatever, right? So you take these vertical slices and then every two weeks you're saying, see, look, it's evolving, right? Um, this word tailoring happens a lot. 
Um, I would bet on any of these exams, you're going to get it. You'll probably see that word tailoring a few times. Uh, as we've seen a few slides ago when we talked about the different certifications and specifically Discipline Agile. Discipline Agile doesn't come out and say you got to do Scrum. Discipline Agile says you've got choices. Um, so PMI probably took to that when they looked at the Discipline Agile folks in that acquisition and said, hmm, okay, um, they're into tailoring. So basically take the approaches that work best for your organization, mix and match and implement what works for you. The really important thing is to be agile. Um, heck, sometimes your uh, project methodology for a given project could be a blend. You could have predictive for some of the work streams, uh, some of the work, agile for others. Uh, you may have some you know, maybe you do some heavy planning in a waterfall way, but your execution is these tight iterative cycles, um, that kind of thing. So tailoring means adjust. Um, if, when you go to a tailor or a seamstress, you're getting your clothes adjusted to fit you. That's what tailoring is for projects. You take the methodologies and you adjust them for the need of that project. You wanna be customer oriented and do what's best for the project. Now I know for some people, um, there are people out there that are very, I'll use the word religious about a certain methodology. Like if it's Scrum, it's always Scrum. We always do it this way. Okay, and that works um, for certain organizations and it works for certain projects. PMI doesn't have that kind of, um, uh, PMI is moving more towards a principled based uh, organization versus a heavy process um, strong um, edict kind of uh, world, good or bad. Um, but I know some of you are gonna run into scrum masters that say, this is the only way you must do it this way. You don't have to just navigate that with that scrum master coach. Um, and they're good people and you know their heart's in the right place and they're right and so are you, right? So you just have to figure out what how right you wanna be for your project. Uh, next slide. So here's a bunch of agile methodologies. The methodologies is an approach, a method. Um, Scrum is the number one out there. You'll see a lot of Scrum, whether you're looking at LinkedIn, Indeed, uh, organizations that adopt agile, they tend to use Scrum. Uh, extreme programming is very unique to uh, uh, software development where Scrum, um, there's a little bit more uh, broader appeal. Feature development, the feature driven development, lean software development, agile unified process used to be called RUP, the rational process. They renamed it to AUP, uh, Crystal, and dynamic systems development method. So I would tell you is like, you're going, oh my gosh, there's like seven methodologies. Yeah, and there's probably some others. From a priority, you need to know all of them really, 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 really know Scrum you know, in this order, right? So um, if you're gonna invest time in learning these, prioritize Scrum over DSDM. Uh, you, may get one, you may get one question on Crystal, you'll get five more questions on Scrum because um, they're, they're biasing it towards the, the market. Know them all though, don't, so don't hear me say, Oh, don't study Crystal. Joe said, don't worry about Crystal. I'm saying worry about it, but you're not gonna get more than one or two questions. Um, but on Scrum, you better know it inside and out. And XP, FDD, et cetera. Next slide. So Scrum is the most popular agile methodology. Some organizations combine it with XP or with Kanban uh, for a broader appeal. Uh, Kanban, I think I explained later. Kanban is um, uh, a visual uh, work visualization tool where you have a board with uh, cards on it and the cards reflect work and you show where work is either in queue, in process or done. Uh, sometimes Scrum gets con combined with Kanban for Scrumban. Uh, Scrum is often um, used in conjunction with XP, extreme programming. The um, we'll talk about extreme programming a little bit. The three pillars in Scrum: VIA, VIA, or TIA, 
And it's a good way for you to remember that from a studying perspective. Uh, visibility and transparency, physical or digital boards are used to show progress. So some of you may be working for organizations that have these lean boards or agile boards or Kanban boards or physical whiteboards with post-it notes on them. Um, I know there are tools out there like Azure DevOps and Conboard and Trello and Rike and Smartsheet, and Microsoft Planner, there's a whole bunch of them out there. But the goal of those tools is to make all the work visible. Isn't it funny, like sometimes a senior leader goes, what are those guys working on, right? When you have a board like that, you invite somebody, to, they can just walk up to the board and see what people are working on and what status it's in. So that's that visibility transparency. The I is for inspection. Inspection means give people a look-see at what the deliverables are. Cards on the board are nice, real work, real software, real results are better. So scheduling demos, reviews, and retrospectives. The demo or review is the inspect the product being built. The retrospective is an inspection of the process, the behavior, the team dynamics. So you do demos and reviews to look at the product, the software, uh, and the retrospective to look at the process, the behaviors. And then adaptation, continuous improvement. Um, if you keep making the same mistakes or keep doing the same thing over and over again incorrectly, you're not going to get a better result. So adapting your processes, learning from the demos, learning from the retrospectives. Um, uh, if your, your flow of work isn't steady and consistent, do I need more staff? Do I need more training? Are there external dependencies I need to resolve? But adapting is key in Scrum. Uh, Mark had a question in the chat. Does the ACP get into any of the products? No, um, it stays high level. So know what a Kanban is, have in your, maybe in your mind, the whole um, backlog in process done or to do doing done in your head. Uh, that's all you're really gonna need to know. And then you need to know that Kanban is that the work visualization tool. Very good question, Mark, thank you. Thanks for coming tonight, Mark. We don't pay people for questions though, so, but thank you. <laughs> um, they're very good. Uh, scrum roles, the scrum master, the development team and the product owner, those are the three key roles. The scrum master is the servant leader and coach for scrum. They ensure that the scrum process are being followed and they're teaching um, and coaching and mentoring the people on the team and the product owner to make sure they're following process. Uh, the scrum master is may or may not be the project manager. The project manager tends to look for uh, external dependencies. They do the budgeting, scheduling, staffing, uh, training assessments, overall long-term direction. Uh, sometimes that project manager is also the scrum master, uh, but not all, all the time. The scrum master has more of an inward focus on the team and the behaviors, where the project managers probably has a little bit more of an outward focus. Um, I, on the particular exam, I don't think they really get into, um, they could be like, which of the following roles is a servant leader for the team? Um, and if you see that scrum master is the right answer. The development team, the construction team, they're the ones that are skilled to deliver every aspect of the final product. Your ideal team should be able to do every bit of work on that project. And then the product owner, it's basically your, your primary customer representative. They're accountable for the deliverables, prioritization of the backlog. The backlog is a list of desired features and functionality. They get prioritized. Things get um, pulled out of the backlog and set up and um, get ready for um, given being given to the team for uh, working on it. All right, so those are the three key roles. Next slide. Um, the ceremonies, uh, ceremonies, when you think of ceremonies, you're thinking meetings, right? Um, events, 
you got the sprint planning meeting. So a sprint is that time box I mentioned earlier, two, three, or no more than four weeks. Um, at the beginning of that sprint, the beginning of that two weeks, you have a planning meeting that says, here's our work that's coming available. Here's the next available work. Here's what's prioritized. Let's all talk about the work. Let's estimate the work. Let's figure out who's going to do what, plot it on the con board, Kanban board, um, and then get rolling. Um, every day, there's a daily scrum meeting. It's usually a stand-up, 15 minutes. The scrum master doesn't necessarily have to facilitate the meeting, but they ensure that the meeting happens. They could facilitate it. Ideally, the development team rotates it between themselves. Um, the role of the scrum master is to make sure it happens, not necessarily that they facilitate, although they can. The sprint review, the review means look a demo. It's a demo of the deliverables and the customer provides feedback. And then the retrospective, um, is the last thing. So the sprint review and the sprint retrospective is on the last day of the two weeks. The sprint planning is on the first day and the daily scrum meeting is every day. Next slide. Extreme programming, it's based on five values. Communication, simplicity, keep it simple. Feedback, courage, focus on what is required, accept feedback and make changes and respect, respect each other as a value team member. So this is all real basic stuff that regardless of as extreme programming, I mean, why, why wouldn't you want this on a regular project, on a predictive project, right? Um, but it is the, the five key values or tenets of extreme programming. And extreme programming is really software development oriented. Next slide. Extreme programming fundamental principles, rapid feedback, get feedback as soon as possible, assume simplicity, incremental change. Incremental means a little bit at a time. You're gonna see this, you know, this, um, this object get grow and evolve and improve and add features until it ultimately is a fully featured software application that you're looking for. You embrace change. So both in Scrum and in XP, we are encouraged to embrace change. That is so difficult for people. That backlog, that list of work, the list of features, the list of requirements, they're changing all the time. The only thing you do with either Scrum or XP is you fix the allocation. You fix the budget. You say, we're going to have a team of seven people for 12 months. Do, do your best, right? And you just deliver as much value as soon as you can with high quality um, and quality. Uh, obviously you want quality work, nothing hur hurried or shoddy. Next slide. Um, so this is, uh, and Mark, again, I was just teasing you, Mark, you're a good man. Um, uh, your great questions. So I, it's really important, not necessarily to know specific technologies, but in general, what these terms are and what they mean. And, um, you know, there, there's a number of these words that are um, uh, based um, on Japanese or based on um, uh, other languages like Kanban is a sign is the it really means a sign board, um, but it's visual management make the work visible on a whiteboard on Microsoft planner on ASDO. Um, Kaizen is continuous improvement. So always improving, always doing retrospectives, always making changes. Let's get better and better and better. Lean is more of a parent than a child. So lean is at the top. Agile is a subset of lean. Um, Agile is based on lean principles, eliminating waste, focusing on customer value. Um, you don't need to know a ton about lean for the ACP exam. Um, if you did um, have an opportunity to look um, understand a little bit about value stream mapping, uh, things like uh, problem statements, uh, that would be good, at least contextually, it'd be good to have that background as you take the exam. Uh, value stream mapping, problem statements. Uh, Tim Woods is a common um, uh, mnemonic to remember uh, waste and other things that happen in lean or when you don't have lean. Uh, breaking down the work into epics, features, and stories. So 
those of us classically trained in project management, it's the old WBS, the work breakdown structure. You break it down, break it down, break it down until you get to the work package. In the agile world, it's epics, features, and stories. It's a hierarchy. It's not a one-to-one -one match to WBS, but conceptually, it's that breakdown of work into individual stories. Those stories are what gets delivered in the two-week Tom box. A backlog is the bucket list. It's your to-do list. In fact, if you use Microsoft Planner as your tool, they call those columns on the tool buckets. So if you've seen the movie Bucket List or if you have a bucket list, it's a list of the things you wanna do. The backlog is the list of things we wanna do. Um, information radiators versus information refrigerators. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of cute. So radiators radiate heat. They make the work and progress visible. Therefore, the Kanban is a information radiator, a dashboard, a um, if you're publishing status anywhere on a SharePoint site or something like that for everyone to see, that's an information radiator. Information radiates from that source and makes it visible. An information refrigerator um, keeps work risk and impediments hidden. Now in the agile world, you guessed it, it's better to have radiators and refrigerators, right? You want everything out in the open. You wanna have open dialogue. You wanna have daily scrum meetings. You wanna tackle things early. You want everyone to know somebody walking by, what's going on with that project? They can look at your board and see what the goals are for the two weeks. So information radiators is better than information refrigerators. Next slide. Uh, a whole bunch of other terminology here. I'm not gonna go through all the different uh, words, um, but from an exam perspective, you'll need to know what these things are. A lot of times these words are possibilities in the multiple choice. Um, cumulative flow diagram kind of shows uh, work. Um, Laurie asked about agile smell. I, I um, have to remember uh, what that means. I think that means um, you know something's not right, uh, but I'll double check that. Uh, Value-driven delivery, velocity. Velocity is the pace in which you're delivering value. Uh, work in progress, WIP, um, WIP limits. You want to limit how much work in progress you have. It's better to have work not started. If you remember from the Agile principle, um, the it's better to have work is, um, your goal is to have work not done, not started. So if you're gonna start something, finish it is the message. You don't wanna have a lot of whip like, hey, I started this, but I had to put it down to work on something else. That's not good. You're gonna have a, a, um, a collection of things not done and that's frustrating and you gotta worry about it. It's better to pick something up, get it done, put it down. Grooming is getting the backlog, um, you know, understanding what's in the backlog. The refinement is actually pulling things out of the backlog and really understanding estimates. Bunch of other uh, um, common terminology here too. The textbooks that I recommended, the, the 12 reference guides that they have uh, recommended, definitely research each one of these. Likely you'll have questions about these on your exam. Uh, next slide. Uh, wireframes, prototypes, you want to know the distinction between the two. They sound like the same. There's a slight difference. Um, wireframes are more visual. Prototypes are more almost functional. Uh, Mockups, they may interchange the words on certain questions. Uh, definitely just look at the definition and just have them clear in your head. Uh, burn up charts and burn down charts. These are ways to depict progress on the project. Um, burn up chart, you're burning up, you're, you're taking uh, completed work and you wanna show it increasing over time, right? So your progress, your, if you think of a graph in the line, the X, Y axis, the line is going up and to the right because um, you want completed work to increase over time. Burn down chart is, hey, I got this pile of remaining work and I want to see that pile 
get lo- shorter and shorter over time. Um, so I don't know if you want to think about like uh, for a burn down chart, like if you've got a bunch of leaves in your backyard and you rake them all up and as you bag up the leaves, the pile of leaves shrinks over time. That's more like a burn down. Um, you don't necessarily have to light fire to the leaves, but that's kind of the idea where burn up is, um, let's say you're building something and you're, every time you accomplish something, there's a little bit more on the pile, like that way. Uh, refactoring, uh, refactoring could be healthy. Uh, it's taking um, code or product and kind of optimizing it after it's built. Sometimes something's built and it's not quite um smooth or elegant, maybe it was patched together. Refactoring lets you clean up code, clean up uh, optimized code um, or optimize the product for use. Uh, servant leader shares powers and serves the team. They coach and mentor the team on processes and helps them remove impediments. Impediments and blocks are things that are getting in the team's way. The servant leader is a coach or a mentor. If the development team can solve their own impediments, great. If they can't, the scrum master servant leader needs to get in there, schedule meetings, have discussions, say, all right, let's talk this through. Let's confront this thing. Let's get it solved. The emergent leader, the individual on a team that others perceived as most influential among the group, the leader acquires the role by others supporting his or her behavior and influence. So the emergent leader is somebody on the team that people respect and they'll defer to whenever there's a decision or a recommendation. I got a question in the chat. Oh, that was the agile smell. I'll have to look that up. I remembered it um, this weekend. (laughs) Um, Next slide. All right, so there's a lot to study. You need to pass, not be perfect practice, 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 eliminate choices in the multiple choices and pick the best answer out of those that remain. Um, And Mark, again, great question earlier. Um, Ideally, like if the multiple choice has four choices, you're eliminating two and then you're working the uh, last two. Think the other tricks, like with any multiple choice, you're looking for always and never and um, all the above, any of the aboves, um, the um, look for, um, uh, make sure you read the question. You don't want to add to the question. Like you have your own personal experiences and you definitely don't want to bring your work, your company into the exam. The exam has no idea where you work or anything about your company's culture. So get that out of there. You're, you're really just focused on the approach and uh, that and um so that's how you should answer. So you're going to learn, and that's what you do by practicing. Go, that one's wrong, that one's wrong. These two sound right. I'm going to pick A. And if you're still not confident, mark it for review and come back later, but at least you picked one. Practice without time constraints first. Some people get really like, oh, I got to do 120 questions in three hours. Yes, you do. But you don't have to do it the first time out. Like practice at home with an open time limit. Just Go grab some sample questions and work on them as fast as you like, right? Just get used to answering questions and then choices. And you're going to find over time as you study and as you do practice, it'll be a little bit more routine. You're going to be a little bit more relaxed. Then towards the, when you're about to take the test weeks before, the week of, the day before, that's where you want to be able to answer the questions with within the time constraint. I think people get scared and nervous when they try to impose that time constraint up front. If you don't know the material, you're just frustrating yourself. Learn the material, take the take the sample quizzes, sample exams, practice ones. When you get closer to the actual test date, then focus on time. Um, and work on realistic speed. You don't want to go super fast, right? Because you could just um, be not reading the questions completely. Um, if you study hard enough, the real exam will be easier than the practice exam. Next slide. Oh, okay. So we're um, at the end of the core presentation there. Uh, any questions? 
I know you were posing them in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Again, if, if anyone has any question, please just use the chat feature on Zoom to post. Uh, meanwhile, we'll go through the last, uh, some of the slides there. Yeah, there is a question in there, but we'll, we'll go ahead and go through the slides and then I can answer at the end. Yeah, um, technical Thursday webinars uh, in the last or in the past year, the uh, Northeast Ohio chapter covered uh, topics like Microsoft Project, Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Planners, Tableau, and um, we had a, or we have a Thursday technical webinars. It's a, it's a 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. webinar. So we are looking for speakers and topics and presenters. If someone uh, like to present, has a, wants to share an experience, uh, just please let us know and contact them or send an email to vb-programs at pmineo.org with your suggestion. And on the next slide, um, upcoming chapter events. Again, just a reminder in Northeast Ohio website, pmineo.org, you will see all our events under event event list. In uh, 11, uh, 11, 12 tomorrow, we have a BMI, BMI's virtual experience series um, and uh, again, evening we have a, you cannot manage a project to success. You must lead a project to success. This, uh, this event offered by BMI Upstate New York chapter, uh, 1118, Women in Project Management Virtual Book Club, 12320, 12, Change Management Concentrations, December 2020, social and networking virtual events, we will have it. And 12-15-20, how can EQ help me? Practical insight for leaders. In uh, February 2021, 20, we will have a virtual job fair. It's a two days events. Uh, we are working on that. February 17, 21, annual state of the chapter. Sorry. Uh, Another another way to keep up with your BDUs, uh, BDU, the PM, PMI Northeast Ohio chapter events we talked in the slide, uh, in the previous slide, we have you have a projectmanagement.com has a webinars use a BMI login uh, to access the webinars, podcast using your favorite podcasting app or on the web, PMI project feed podcast and volatile manage this podcast. Um, this uh, slide to claim your BDU one, 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 one and a half technical BDU. Joe, back to the question in the chat. Yeah, so I'll tackle the one in the Q and A and then there's a couple, two, three in the chat. So the one in the Q and A is similar to one in the chat. Um, any particular recommendation for pre-exam education hours, preferred providers, key requirements for eligibility, et cetera. So um, what I would say is, oh, so I, you know, I do, I'm a volunteer, a long time volunteer for the chapter. So I'm not giving you the chapter answer, I'm giving you mine. Whether you, you have to understand whether or not you need instructor led um, discipline, lecture, in order to study for an exam, whether it's the ACP, the PMP, the CAPM, whatever it is. I would recommend, regardless of who you are, take some time, purchase, borrow a book, um, start doing the research, get in your head, like, do I have enough work experience? Am I already surrounded by Agile or am I new to Agile? Um, I mean, there's a prereq uh, from an education and work experience that you need to overcome first. Um, but whether or not you take a class or you self-study, it's a personal decision. Some people cannot take an exam without a lectured or structured class. Some people are good at self-study. They're already been doing agile. Um, they're surrounded by it at work. They think they're pretty good at it. They just need to know the exact for the exam. Um, from a company perspective, 
the um, RMC project uh, where Mike Griffith's book is based out of, they also have training. RMC, Rita McClay, he, uh company, she's passed away, but her company does training. Velocity, who's a, I guess if I had to give the chapter answer, Velocity is a partner. They're offering discounts if you're a chapter member. Go to our chapter website for details. So if you want the chapter answer, go to Velocity. Um, there are other companies like Simply Learn, GreatPM.com, GR number eight PM.com. They all offer uh, PMIACP prep um, courses. Uh, some of these companies also offer Scrum and the other certifications as well. Um, so Adam, I think I covered um, everything there. And far as um, work experience, uh, you need to get the work experience on the job at work, but not necessarily leading the team, but being on the team um, for so many months. Agile smell. So Laura, thank you for asking me about that. So it, I do remember now. So an example, um, uh, so my analogy for a smell is basically like if you smell smoke, there's probably fire someplace. If you're suspicious about a behavior or a response, there's probably more to it, right? You're, there's something deeper there. For example, let's say you're in a stand-up with your project team. One of your team members says, you ask them, well, how, how much progress did you make? Well, um, I'm about 10% done of the, the work. 10%, huh? Right. So everyone goes, oh, that sounds great. 10%. And we've got 10 days in the sprint. That means you'll be 100% done in 10 days, right? 10% uh, is just an arbitrary number. 10% of what? Right. Um, or uh, I'm still working on that item from yesterday. That's their update, right? And you go, you're still working on the item from yesterday. Did you make progress? Are you stuck? Is there a block? So basically, a smell is. Um, suspicion, like you, you're, there's something going on, there's deeper, you're seeing the surface level, um, but there's something more. Let's say your velocity from sprint to sprint or iteration to iteration is up and down, it's all over the place. So there's something going on there. Why don't you have the a good pattern or cadence? It may take a while to get there, um, but why is it so sporadic? Um, if there's quality issues, like Minor quality issues may turn into major ones. So that's what an agile smell is. Thank you, Laura, great question. Um, next one on here, uh, enrolling in a course. Yeah, like if you're gonna enroll in one, um, you can get the chapter discount by going by Velocity. Um, there's a lot of online WBT um, type companies, Velocity is one of them. Uh, there's also Simply Learn. Uh, simply spelled S-I-M-P-L-I-L-E-A-R-N. Uh, they're pretty decent. Um, GreatPM.com. I think they're still around. RMC Project. Um, I believe Cornelius Felcher. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, again, I haven't taken them all. I haven't talked to people that have taken them all. Um, I know people have taken the Velocity Teach and they like that one. Um, Mark's question, can you give a quick sense or two on why anyone would look at the other tracks of the Agile certification? Um, I, I'm gonna get my head, I need to wrap my head around that too. So the whole, for the past five years up until 2019, it was always the ACP, right? They were promoting the ACP. That was the only um, PMI was tiptoeing into Agile where there was like the whole world was doing Agile and PMI was still on this like, process heavy, sorry, I'm sounding a little biased there, but process oriented, forms oriented, document oriented approach to projects. And that was valid 30 years ago because everything was that way. But as we have evolved, a lot more people are doing agile. Now they've kind of like spun a total 180 and they're doing a lot more agile. Agile practice guide, agile in every chapter of the PMBOK, um, uh, the acquisition of discipline agile, so I think what they're doing, Mark and others here, is they're putting together, hey, here's a suite of things. And depending on your role and depending on the approach you take, one thing may be better than another. So, for example, the ACP, you know, to me, that's a general purpose exam, general purpose thing. You could be any role on the project, right? 
You don't necessarily have to be the coach. You're just, you're on an agile project and you want to show that you know the agile terminology. Um, as you go around that clock in the other direction, like if, you, if you're going to do Scrum, you have choices. You could do the Discipline Agile Scrum Master Cert, or you can go outside of PMI and do the Certified Scrum Master, or you could do the Scrum.org's Professional Scrum Master, and there's a Scrum Bac, and there's a whole bunch of other Scrum certifications out there. Scrum is the number one. PMI got smart and said, we better offer a scrum thing too, because if we want to be the agile leaders, um, and again, they're late to the market, later to the market than the other guys. So they've got some catching up to do. Um, but uh, scrum's the number one thing they, they thought you bet we better have scrum offerings, but that's unique to that role. The scrum master for a scrum met methodology, the servant leader, coach or mentor, right? If you're not going to be that person, don't get the scrum master cert, in my opinion. The Agile coach, if you're not going to do Scrum, is you're going to do more of a blended or an Agile or a tailored approach. That Agile coach in the bottom right is very similar to, um, and actually the, the three on the right are kind of an, um, an evolution. So you could be the Scrum master, senior, and then the Agile coach. Um, so they so they build build on each other. So it's like level one, two, and three. Now that I read it again, it looks like it's three levels. But that third level is more of a general agile coach, not just scrum. Um, so I, I guess it depends on where you are, what role you're going to have, what your interest lies, and how marketable you want to be. Um, The, uh, the other, let me look at the other question in the chat. Um, I have a question from Laura. Laura, yep. How many hours of experience would I need from an Agile when filling out the application for the Agile cert? So for the ACP, you need um, eight months Agile experience, not leading, being. You have to be on one more projects um, you need eight months of agile experience and a year of general project experience. Now, however, Laura, I know you're a PMP. Anybody here that's a PMP or a PGMP, they waive that whole, they don't ask you all the questions about months or years. They go, oh, you're one of those? Come on, sign up, right? So you just kind of waive that thing. But if you're not a PMP, or a PGMP, you have to show eight months of work on an Agile project and one year of general project management experience. Interesting though, the ACP is looking for that leadership experience, even though it's a practitioner, kind of weird. The other guys on the right-hand side are not assuming you've already got leadership experience. Um, you can go and sit the discipline Agile Scrum Master with no experience. Hopefully that helped there. Any other questions? I, I don't see any, any questions in the chat. Uh, so yeah, this is the last, uh, this is the last, uh, just this is the last slide for claiming your uh, claiming BDUs. Again, thank you, thank you, Joe, for the great presentation and information. Thank you all for attending this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. And the slides and the recording will be uploaded tonight, and we'll get it out to everybody soon. That, yeah. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I think. Thank you, Amir. Yep. You are the host. You can end up from your end. All right.